how much does the Christ event solve? Um, I'm not going to comment on the title. I'm just going to let that percolate uh, during the lecture, and we'll see where we end up at the end. But the title of the lecture implies that there is something at stake when in relation to writings that eventually became the Christian New Testament, Judaism is drawn into the conversation. Of course, to those today who locate themselves firmly within one religion or the other and thus adhere to values and practices not shared by the other, it might not seem necessary that such a conversation take place at all. And there are New Testament scholars, if I can say, that don't require it or don't think that it is of any real significance. After all, being conscious of one's religious identity goes hand in glove with discerning features that distinguish one form of persuasion from another. When compared with Second Temple Judaism, however, comparisons are not always easy to draw, especially since many followers of Jesus in the early generations were Jews themselves and shared with other Jews the rich, diversifying, and evolving heritage found in sacred tradition and practice. Nevertheless, as we well know, comparisons have been drawn precisely in order to determine those elements of tradition that diverged just enough from the mother religion to forge a path that would lead eventually to an irretrievable parting of the ways. For many, the essential departure lies somewhere in the area of Christology. That is, the extraordinary claims Jesus' followers would make about his exalted status in relation to God. We are witnesses to such a debate during the last 25 years between, for example, Maurice Casey, may he rest in peace, James Dunn, Larry Hurtado, and Richard Balcom, and many others about the whens, the hows, and the whats of convictions about Jesus that cannot be anchored comfortably within the framework of Second Temple Jewish traditions. When, however, we look at the question of evil in the New Testament and again through a glance at traditions that took shape during the Second Temple period, we find ourselves dealing with a different kind of problem. One can quickly observe that according to most writings of the New Testament, the place of Jesus at the very heart and center of God's activity, a Jew in recent times who was crucified and whose followers claimed was resurrected from the dead and exalted to the right hand of God, makes the movement we anachronistically call early Christianity stand out in relief. There is plenty of theological content and indeed ritual practice to imagine that here we have to do with the emergence of an innovative way of thinking, centered as it was in what has happened in recent history. Although it is casually claimed that Christ is God's quintessential answer to evil, we are dealing with a more functional problem, which we may formulate as follows. What did Jesus' early followers who wrote about him expect their understanding of God to do for them and their audiences? Put another way, what is the impact, since it's R-E-F time, you know, impact, of a given conviction about God's activity in cosmic space and time? For those who take human experience as a point of departure, language about God offers a way to put life's problems from small to overwhelming into perspective. Such a perspective does not entail removal of or flight from evil so much as offers a way to handle or negotiate it as an inextricable part of life. The content of religious conviction, however diverse, functions in some way to come to terms with a world that for much of the time looks or threatens to be very different. <clears throat> okay. Such statements of realism may seem uncontroversial. However, if the content of theological expression in one religious tradition is compared with that of, an, of another, an acknowledgment of a common or shared function can quickly evaporate or suffer neglect. If differences in the story or narrative about God's interaction with humanity and the cosmic order come into focus, 
when we consider the more obvious differences between early Christian tradition as it began to emerge from Jewish roots within the socio-cultural complex of the Eastern Mediterranean world. We do not have to reach very far before identifying a claim that God has acted through Jesus in a singular way. One might go on to claim, for example, with Hurtado, that devotion to and, um, and inclusion of the exalted Jesus in the worship of God for all the continuity with contemporary strands of Jewish thought likewise marks a departure from Second Temple tradition. However, closely bound up with such a claim is a theological judgment that renders Christian tradition as better or more effective in dealing with the persistent problem of evil in human experience. I'm saying that a lot of what New Testament we were all bound up, not only with our descriptive task of what is going on in these documents, but when we do religious compa uh, comparison of religions between our set of texts in the New Testament and our set of texts that lie outside the New Testament, not least Second Temple literature, um, we find ourselves working hermeneutically um, underneath the surface. Before we jump to such a conclusion, though, which I think is in considerable need of nuance, it is worth thinking about how many, if not most, scholars of the New Testament have articulated ways <clears throat> Jesus and his early followers, including the Apostle Paul, burst through certain bounds set by pious Judaism during the Second Temple period. In this respect, it is precisely in the understanding of God's redemptive activity in time that many of our colleagues, past and present, have found essential distinguishing features that in turn present Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God and subsequent faith claims about his significance, not merely as definitive moments in salvation history, but also as better or more effective in the removal or management of evil. Much of the discussion can be organized around the notion of apocalyptic. Here I have inverted commas, a term that has been subjected to a lot of debate during the last 50 years. Though the term itself suggests the disclosure of something that is hidden, it has been contested as a theological category through which both the closeness of Christian tradition and its distance from Jewish religiosity from the Second Temple period can be discerned. I'd like to name a number of examples here. First, in relation to claims about the historical Jesus, and then in relation to what is frequently maintained in constructions of Pauline theology. Of course, it was C.H. Dodd, who is known in the post-war years for having presented Jesus as one who proclaimed the nearness of God's kingdom in such a way that it was no longer as in Jewish tradition, the object of hope for an imminent or remote time. The implication is that Jesus was able to convey something that no one else in his time could have, and that therefore his activity was more effective in a combat against evil, in bringing salvific activity of God to bear on, on his immediate environment. And if not, then, on the heels of Pauline and more general New Testament theologies of recent years, I want to apply this view to Paul's claims about the significance of Christ. And I will deal with then three Pauline theologians as a way of, of bringing together what they claim about Paul in relation to Judaism. But first, allow me to cite two New Testament scholars from Germany, one older, one younger, to illustrate this point. First, there is Ferdinand Hahn, from the, uh, retired from the University of, uh, of Munich in his Theologie des Neuen Testaments, the last version of which was published in 2011, as he begins to comment on the message of Jesus in the Gospels. Hahn speaks for many when he matter-of-factly declares the following, and here I just translate his text. During the course of history, Israel's hope for salvation became increasingly future in orientation. Salvation could only be partially obtained at the earlier period um, in the present 
while the notion of future salvation gathered strength. This emphasis developed to such a degree that in Jewish apocalyptic tradition, it was essentially that Jewish apocalyptic tradition was essentially empty of salvation as far as the present is concerned. Mit einer völligen Heilslehre, der, gerech, uh, der Gegenwart gerechnet wurde. With the result that hope could only be realized by a decisive act of God. The future character of God's activity is supported by the notion of this age in which God's reign cannot become a reality and the current world um, and that the current world and time for salvation to occur at all must be replaced by an age to come when things will be different. End of quote. A younger example of such an attitude comes to us from Michael Tilly, current holder of the chair for uh, Neues Testament and Antikes Judentum in Tübingen. In his otherwise very good little book <laughs> on apocalyptic, published in 2012, I quote, from a socio-religious perspective, early Christianity shows many parallels with Jewish apocalyptic. Nevertheless, the claim that there is unbroken continuity between apocalyptic and Christian faith or that apocalyptic is the mother of Christianity, as Kesemann maintained, is questionable. Christian faith is in no way simply shaped by an apocalyptic worldview. The most important difference between the early Christian kerygma and Jewish apocalyptic has to do with the early Christian conviction regarding the activity of God in the world and in history. Determinative and descriptive of early Christian apocalyptic is the already of God's salvific activity. This very point is in tension with the understanding of the world and eschatology of Jewish apocalyptic. History is, for early Christianity, no longer the place of godlessness, as it is in Jewish tradition, and a lack of salvation. Christian faith is not only grounded in the hope of the coming of the kingdom of God, but at the same time is a recognition of the historical reality of salvation that is in Jesus. End of quote. Do you see what's happening here? If salvation is present in Christian tradition in a way that it is not in any part of Judaism, then an underlying assumption may be a form of what I would call existential supersessionism, brought to bear on our texts from antiquity. Christian faith did it better. That is, it dealt with the problem of evil better, amongst other things, than Judaism. The words of Han and Tilly are not isolated opinions. I'm sure many of you can recognize other literature and when you've heard things like this, even Norman Perrin and you know, others, you don't have to go very far. And it repeats itself in almost every introduction to New Testament or even theology of the New Testament that is published today. That may be too sweeping, but I, I think it's not far from the truth. They reflect, by and large, what many, if not most, Christian theologians and scholars in New Testament studies ultimately think about how early Christian apocalyptic tradition relates to its Jewish counterpart. To emphasize how pervasive this approach is, I'd like to offer a sketch of the problem in relation to Pauline scholarship before offering a suggestion about how Jewish apocalyptic tradition may be reread or understood. So, the two ages. This is maybe what you're thinking already in the background. If we ask New Testament specialists from very recent times to the end of the World War, uh, uh, if we ask them, we may not be surprised to encounter more than one answer. Nevertheless, there has been a remarkable convergence in relation to Paul's understanding of time as it can be compared with Jewish tradition. This convergence, however, has less to do with what is being claimed for Paul himself than with the way Jewish apocalyptic thinking against or upon which Paul's thought is understood has been portrayed. In other words, Jewish tradition operates as a kind of foil at, at, at each level. And, and uh, what is one to make of this um, without trying to make the, even the Jewish world look better than it really was either? Drawing mostly on the scholarly work of influential studies of ancient Jewish apocalyptic, including those of R.H. Charles in particular, who 
who spoke very casually and wrote voluminously on the doctrine of the two ages, largely taken from rabbinic tradition and in, imported into the earlier period. Literature on Paul has regarded this doctrine of the two ages, in which one age follows or succeeds on the other, as the essential Jewish framework within which Paul's, or in relation to which Paul's gospel um, was engaged. The two ages Paul is seen to have modified consists respectively of the present age and the future eschatology, eschatological age to come. The former is a time marked by evil manifested through suffering and wrongdoing within the created order. The latter envisions the establishment of divine rule that will wipe out evil and put to right all wrongs and injustices in line with God's purposes for the created order. Of course, it has been recognized that construals of time and Second Temple Jewish literature cannot be simplified into such a bipartite scheme. It is noted, for example, that the age to come could be understood in some sense as a return to primordial time and would thus not merely manifest itself as an unprecedented future age. That's something we want to return to a little bit later. Moreover, some Pauline scholars have observed that several texts depict the future within the present world order as the unfolding of a series of events, usually catastrophic and sometimes with the advent of a messianic figure who will herald the conclusion of this age in anticipation of that divine act that will inaugurate the eschaton. Now, there's no need to question the existence of the notion of a distinction in Jewish apocalyptic and related literature between a present age and a future world order. And we've already heard some papers that relate very nicely to this scheme. There's also no need to question whether this understanding of time can be nuanced in the ways just mentioned. However, it is helpful to discuss two points. First, what it means to talk about the way Paul has appropriated such an outlook. And in view of this, second, whether in fact more can be said about how some Jewish writers, we can, I won't list them here, could think about time. First, we look at what positing, the positing of two aeons as a major way of understanding Jewish apocalyptic thought has meant for several influential Pauline interpreters. I've dealt with a bunch. I'm boiling them down to three. Ernst Kesemann, J. Lewis Martin, thank you, Jamie, and James Dunn. It'd be nice if he were here. Acknowledging the risk of oversimplifying the differences between and nuanced arguments of each of these scholars that they brought to their readings of Paul, I think it is possible to identify a common thread amongst them in relation to the apocalyptic undercurrent that has shaped their work. In sketching this, I am less concerned with what Jewish traditions um, influenced these New Testament scholars than with the assumptions they have made regarding what these traditions could not have included. To get a foil is to say things are not there, which in fact might be there if we look just a little bit further. Kazeman. Maybe I don't need to say anything about Kazeman, but I'm going to here. His views on the righteousness of God is in Paul as, in, as the invading power of God and his claim that the apocalyptic was the mother of all Christian theology are well known. Lying in the background of these claims is the apocalyptic ideal of two aeons, which Paul presupposed. Exegetically, Paul's adaptation of the scheme is vividly illustrated in Romans 5, in which Adam and Christ are antithetically juxtaposed. Whereas Jewish apocalyptic consigned salvation to the future, the advent of Christ, and in particular Christ's death, makes it possible for this to be realized in the present, um, in the present obedience of those who are waiting for this moment, who hear, I'm quoting him, and accept the prophetic proclamation of the standards of the last judgment and pass it on to the whole world, end of quote. What in Jewish apocalyptic is remote has already begun. Paul's reception of the two aeons schema involves a, series, a serious modification of the dominant Jewish view, resulting in a new form of apocalyptic in which we have to do with a distinctive worldview capable of speaking about eschatological salvation and life in the present. Instead of a Jewish scheme, which contrasted between primordial time and the end time, the present age of death is, in Paul's view, confronted by Christ, who is the author and representative of the new eon. 
In other words, for Paul, the end time has already begun. For Kesemann, it is appropriate to speak about Jewish apocalyptic in relation to Paul's theology in two ways. It is a perspective that remains nourished by eschatology, and second, views the cosmos as a place in which divine power, the power not anticipated by Jews until the eschaton, as having broken into the world. The present, then, is one of conflict between the power that comes from the gospel and death that is shared by humanity. Kaysman did not allow the logic of an antithetical typology of Adam and Christ to be determinative for Paul. The advent of Christ did not go, do away with the ongoing power of death in this world. Against what Kaysman refers to as the Hellenistic enthusiasts of Corinth, Paul's thought retained an eschatological edge. Christ inaugurated the end time, but the ultimate conclusion of things remains outstanding a reality that could be placed in service of primitive Christian paranesis and would do so for Paul. The universal realization of the advent of life through Christ um, is now a summons for Christians to confirm in their personal life the change of eons that has already been effected. Kazemet acknowledges in principle the complexity of Jewish apocalyptic thought. However, Paul's language Draws from, the draws from the eschaton into the present the conflict between death and life in a way, um, presumably, um, uh, did not, in a way that did not have any real precedent in existing Jewish paradigms. Kaiserman did not explicitly claim that Paul's adaptation of Jewish apocalyptic eschatology was not anticipated, perhaps because it is precisely this aspect of Paul's indebtedness to Jewish tradition that shaped the distinctive of his theology. However, inasmuch as Paul worked out the significance of Christ in relation to his Jewish heritage, what distinguishes Kaiserman's Paul from Jewish apocalyptic thought, thought is nothing less than radical and indeed innovative in terms of the history of religions. J. Lewis Martin. Kaiserman's understanding of apocalyptic in Paul, while drawing heavily on its eschatological component, nevertheless reflects a use of the term which, when used casually, begins to take on a life of its own. Apocalyptic in Kaiserman could thus wor uh, refer to a worldview in which powers are in conflict, while for others it denoted a view of the world in which hope has a key role to play, especially since the complexities of suffering, sin, and death are neither being vanquished nor necessarily find any tangible reckoning. J. J. Lewis Martin's understanding of apocalyptic takes the matter one step further. For him, it operates as a key to epistemology, and I don't even think today he would back off from that. And there is much in me that is very sympathetic to what he is doing with Paul, but not with Judaism. Rather than allowing the term simply to denote the eschatological future, Martin draws on the fundamental meaning between the word to reveal or to uncover, to emphasize the recognition of a divine disclosure that pertains to both the present age and the age to come. The perception of the one necessarily involves the perception of the other in Christian tradition. If history as Paul knew it is to be brought to end by God, it is because the present world order is being comprehended as essentially evil, Galatians 1.4. Apocalyptic is thus the conviction that God has now given to the elect true perception of both the present developments, the real world, and of a wondrous transformation in the near future. It involves a new way of knowing both present and future. It follows for Martin that the revelatory solution in Paul's thought, if it is to be a solution at all, does not lie in the future as with Jewish apocalyptic, but rather in the present. Therefore, it is possible for the death of Jesus to be regarded as a moment of divine unveiling that confronts and in turn unmasks the world as it now exists. This frame of understanding provided Martin with the way to present Paul's thought uh, um, as a whole and it explains also why he could read a letter like Galatians with its Christocentric <coughs> orientation as no less fundamentally apocalyptic than the other writings of the apostles. 
Thus, even less so than for Kesemann, Martin's approach to apocalyptic does not obligate the interpreter to find any essential continuity with com comparable or contrasting Jewish paradigms. Once things have shifted, there's no need to turn back the clock, as it were. The essential point has happened. And everything that happens subsequent to this is more a comparison that illustrates contrast than anything else. Once God has disclosed God's self in the Christ event as a new way of knowing, all else before becomes functionally irrelevant, not only for Paul, but also for Paul's interpreters. Such an epistemology, a way of knowing that involves divine disclosure within the bounds of the created order as we know it, may arguably be a way of construing the thinking of Paul. But does this also have to mean that Jewish writers did not think about divine disclosure in any analogous way? James Dunn is the last interpreter of Paul to whom we draw attention. Perhaps more than those whose readings of Paul described above, he has attempted to bring Jewish tradition into direct conversation with what he says or maintains about Paul. This is true in particular when it comes to Dunn's view of the works of the laws most of us know here which in several publications he regards as regarded as an expression that had currency amongst Jews in relation to practices that set them apart from Gentiles. What, however, of the function of Jewish apocalyptic thought in the way Dunn reads Paul? Of the several areas he covers in his sixth chapter in his Theology of Paul the Apostle, um, entitled The Process of Salvation, um, is we have his discussion of the two ages in Judaism and Paul's thought. Here it becomes explicit. The chapter opens with a subchapter, the title of which, The Eschatological Tension, sums up the particular emphasis in Paul's modification of Jewish apocalyptic eschatology. So, um, before we address what Dunn identifies as Jewish tradition behind Paul, it is helpful first to observe that it is the context of Pauline scholarship that more immediately determines the position Dunn articulates rather than his engagement with the Second Temple Jewish literature itself. Over against readers for whom Pauline justification by faith translates into God's gracious, unmerited pronouncement of righteousness upon in individuals, namely Stuhlmacher and company and others, Dunn stresses that soteriology, rather than being given, denotes a lifetime process in which persons of faith negotiate between the power of the Spirit in their lives and the inevitable failures and sufferings that will always accompany them. This eschatological tension is known not just by anyone, but is emblazoned upon the consciousness of believers whose participation in the power of the gospel exposes the problems that beset the human being in this age. Now, Dunn presupposes, along with most interpreters of Paul, a Jewish schema of two ages in relation to which the particularity of the apostles' thought can be understood. Dunn takes for granted the view that Paul has modified this scheme by noting a provisional transition from the present age to the age to come in a parousia of Christ. Being in Christ is language that describes the position of believers who participate in this transition. This existence in a new state of being is not, however, what makes Paul different. The realism of Paul's view of life did not permit him to indulge in the already of the Christ event, in contrast, for example, to the strong in Corinth, and neither could Paul retain an eschatology that he had espoused before his apostolic call. And so here I quote Dunn again. The distinctive feature of Paul's theology is not the eschatology, but the tension which his revised eschatology sets up, revised from Judaism. Eschatological hope was a common feature of Paul's religious heritage. But an eschatology split in this way between a decisive already and a still not yet was a new departure. Paul's gospel was eschatological not because of what he still hoped would happen, as Jews do, but because of what he believed had already happened. The old and new ages overlapped. The old present aeon extends from Adam and until the age to come. And during this time, death, sin, and suffering remain undeniable realities. 
The new future aeon is no longer entirely consigned to the future, but has had its beginning in Christ in such a definitive way that the future reality of judgment is guaranteed. The resulting overlap is the time in between, that is, it defines life in Christ and extends from Christ the Christ event until the eschatological judgment that inaugurates the creation of a new cosmos. Dunn's understanding of the way Jewish apocalyptic influenced and was modified by Paul exemplifies what, for all their emphases, different emphases, is true for other interpreters we have, can consider here. Taken as the point of departure, his conviction about God's defining act in the death and resurrection of Jesus, the apostle is considered to have radically modified the notion of two successive ages. This modification represents not only Paul's particular contribution to early theologies that were emerging amongst followers of Jesus, but is also an innovation that is specifically Christian and, by implication, is unimaginable for Second Temple Jewish apocalyptic tradition. The point to evaluate here is not to determine which of the construals, be it Kesemans, Martins, or even Duns, is the more probable way to take uh, Paul's thought into account. Instead, what I'm thinking here, and this has implications for how we work through the question of evil, is to reflect on whether or not a myopic focus on Pauline theology to the exclusion of, of other um, uh, theological traditions, related traditions in the Jewish matrix, has resulted in a reductionistic reading of what some Jewish writers could articulate about the impact of God's past activity in creation on space and time of the present age, as well as on the imminent yet essentially different age to come. If we recognize the obvious specificity surrounding claims amount, um, about the significance of the Christ event, would one be correct to infer that Jewish tradition could not have envisaged definitive activity by God against evil in the past on the part of Israel's, yeah, on, uh, that at the same time functions as a guarantee of divine triumph in the future? So models of eschatology in Second Temple apocalyptic thought. So thus far, I've indulged in using the term apocalyptic really casually. It is in part largely due to the frequently impreci imprecise um, application of the word by New Testament scholars that we've reviewed. And I fall into that trap, and I think any one of us who struggle with this honestly probably fall into the trap too. And, but we need to be aware that we're doing that. And much of our task is a struggle for language, is it not? It is impossible within the space here, then, to sketch in detail how problematic this expression has been for those attempting to offer a definition, not only in relation to the purported literary genre called apocalypse, but also with regard to the adjective apocalyptic itself. And you notice I've also used that as a noun, mostly because of the German background. A very brief overview, though, can help us locate just where the problem lies with simplistic paradigms such as the two ages scheme mentioned, uh, attributed to Jewish traditions that were both antecedent and contemporary to the first century. So um, <clears throat> I think uh, some of the scholars who, who hold a, a default position that we must work with a doctrine of two ages or of successive ages um, I don't need to mention them, but I think I should probably throw out a few more names. De Boer is a very good example of that, though he has um, represented the, the Martin School rather well um, and uh, I think has emerged as one of the more influential um, uh, uh, voices from that perspective. Douglas Campbell in a very different way. Uh, we might want to um, discuss that at some point. Um, we don't have the luxury of doing that here. And uh, someone like Beverly Gaventa in yet a very different way. Um, and um, I, I think these positions um, suffer. They, they suffer less for what they're trying to do with Paul, uh, oddly. I, I, you know, th there, there are certainly big nuances there in, in the reading of Paul but they suffer for what they imply about uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, what they imply about Jewish, tradi uh, tr Jewish tradition reductionistically perceived.
So um, scholarship, though, has of course observed the shortcomings of a one-dimensional future orientation of Jewish apocalyptic thought, especially since the earlier, earliest recoverable apocalypses seem just as interested in a spatial understanding of the world made possible through revealed knowledge and in the disclosure of esoteric wisdom as, the, as in the anticipated transformation of the present into a future cosmos. Along the lines of esoteric revelation, the advent of Jesus, including the death, his death, could make certain sense for Paul. While the sapiential, and we've had a reference to that by, by Dr. Wold earlier this afternoon, and cosmological dimensions of apocalyptic thought have enriched the way some have reflected theologically on the significance and impact of the Christ event, the temporal framework within Jewish tradition has not received adequate attention. It it's has been. I mean, we all know that this is the way they thought. It's eschatology. That's where it's at. That's where God is going to finally do something. Now, what do we do with that? Now that we have reified it as something to, to um, contrast um, what we find in New Testament writings uh, with. But it needs more attention. Specifically, in the context of Paul, in relation to what Pauline theologies have assumed about it. Beyond contrasting present and future reality, some writers of apocalyptic texts demonstrated a concern with divine activity as a constant that shaped the unfolding story of Israel as a way, to understand, a way of understanding and posing questions about the present. Furthermore, an influential way of understanding the temporal dimension of apocalyptic thought has been the correspondence, and we all know this, found in some of the writings between Urzeit and Endzeit, a framework construed as a means to reinforce eschatology. Here, various moments out of the primordial past preserved as a repository of images, symbols, and motifs that helped apocalyptic writers to imagine the future. Paradisical existence, once lost, will be restored. A messianic white bull concludes a story that began with an Adamic white bull, so the animal apocalypse, one Enoch. Eschatological judgment draws on imagery from the great flood, number of texts, and Noah's rescue prefigures the salvation of God's people at the end of history. A basis for reconfiguring of for a reconfiguring of primordial images, however, is not all that the sacred past has to offer, and here is where I go into new, new space. And so within the framework of temporality, there is another emphasis that has been neglected, not only by New Testament scholars, but also by specialists in ancient Jewish apocalyptic literature. So when I talk about this with our Jewish colleagues, they, they recognize that this is the case, but, but, but have also defaulted into a rabbinic paradigm of a doctrine of the two ages that is then overlaid onto their reading of Second Temple texts. In addition to helping to describe deteriorating conditions in the world and how the God of Israel will inaugurate a new age, Language about the Uot site also functioned to provide a basis for being confident about such an outcome. God's definitive activity is not only a matter for the future. Rather, it is God's invasive presence to defeat evil in the past. That is, for example, at the time of the great flood. It may sound remote, but, but to talk about the flood in some of these texts is also in the same breath to think about the present, and that's the, that's the point of it. Defeat of evil in the past, time of the Great Flood, that guarantees its annihilation in the future. So I'm not talking about Qumran, as, uh, realized eschatology, that kind of. It's a kind of, uh, of inaugurated eschatology, to borrow uh, Grant's um, uh, 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 term, um, that guarantees that the future that is a hope is, is, is already um, at work. As is well known, the Nephilim and mighty men in Genesis 6-4 were interpreted in several influential Jewish apocalyptic works as giant-sized offspring of disobedient angels and daughters of humanity whose destructive activities led to a crisis 
in which God intervened to destroy their bodies, punish the angels, and ensure the survival of humans who are integral, not the giants, but the humans who are integral to the created order. Those texts were not simply attempts to retell the sacred past. They conveyed to Jews from the third century until the beginning of the common era an assurance that evil, however rampant and overwhelming it may be in the present age, is but a defeated power whose time is marked. Divine victory in the sacred past could even be understood as an expression of God's royal power. So in 1 Enoch 84, Book of Giants 2, the angels address of God as the king of kings. In 1 Enoch 9, this curious lament that functions as a petition. Since God's rule has asserted itself in the cosmos on a global scale, the present era is represented as a time when those who are pious can proceed with some confidence in dealing with the effects of demonic power, knowing that although it cannot be gotten rid of altogether before the ultimate end of things, it is nevertheless possible to address, to curtail, or to manage its effects. This understanding of sacred past and imminent future was not simply a matter of charting how time works. It was a way of defining what it meant to be God's people in the present, and it could manifest itself in terms of a theological anthropology that negotiated the relentless uncertainties of life with the certainty of victory under the covenant. In its influential retelling of the story from the creation until the Israelites' freedom from their slavery, time of slavery in Egypt, the Book of Jubilees, composed during the middle of the second century BCE, describes the condition of humankind after their rescue from the great flood. Here, so Jubilees chapter 5, verse 12, God is said to have given human beings a new and righteous nature. Interesting. God created for them a new and righteous nature in order that with their whole being they will never sin again and be able to live righteously. The remaining narrative of the book confirms time and again that sinning amongst Jews does take place <laughs> after this new nature and that forces of evil continue to be effective amongst God's people. Isn't that just the way it is? How, how different is it from Paul and the, you know, this great Christ event, but what happens? Well, you know, evil persists. However, both this new nature and the defeated condition of demonic powers, so Jubilees chapter 10, continue to be manifest in the story. They anticipate the final result, namely the destruction of all evil, and with it, the fulfillment of God's original design for those who are amongst the elect. The already of evil's defeat um, and the not yet of its manifest destruction was an existing framework that Paul could take for granted. Though the overlap between the present and future age is occasioned for Paul by a recent breakthrough in history, we would not be mistaken to think that there were pious Jews who understood themselves as living in an eschatological tension inspired by confidence of concrete moments of divine activity in the sacred past. Some of it in the recent past, even the war scroll. We had a nice lecture about uh, that addressed the war scroll. Even there, uh, column 14 refers to the getting rid of, 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 of spirits in the more recent past of the community, they don't have to go simply to the remote past and then work from there to imagine that God will win this eschatological battle in the future. There is something in the present that their look to the past does for them that, that establishes a confidence in such an, an outcome. It is simply misleading, if not wrong, to infer with several Pauline scholars that such religiosity is merely the domain of early adherents of Jesus, not least Paul. One storyline that guaranteed the establishment of God's eschatological rule in the cosmos, we're near the end, um, is discernible, of course, is traceable to the time of the Great Flood, as I've already said, and in references we see this to the bastard spirits in the Dead Sea materials. 
These mamzerim, spirits that were thought to have emanated from the giants whose physical bodies had been destroyed during the time or before the time of the flood, are powers of the present age that are described in the songs of the Maskil. Ben, you've worked on these. The text that is significant here is as follows, a time of the dominion of wickedness and in the eras of humiliation of the sons of light and the guilt of the times of those plagued by iniquities, not for an eternal destruction, but for the era of the humiliation of transgression. This era of the humiliation of transgression and this dominion of wickedness stand in tension with one another. They're overlapping. It isn't as though one is expected to follow the other this defeat of them and yet their persistence stand together. In the document, it is by declaring the splendor of God's radiance and in the acclamation of God's power that the activities of a catalog of malevolent forces can be curbed. The Maskeel's decoration about God told in the third person are presumed to be sufficiently potent to diminish or counteract demonic powers that are at work in the present order of things. Although the text does not furnish a prayer for divine protection against these demons, it does work within a framework that holds these two concurrent things in tension. First, the existence of a community of those who are unambiguously righteous and upright. And second, the characterization of the present age as a time of dominion of wickedness. It's not far from Galatians 1.4, perhaps. The Maskeel's song about God, uh, God addressed to those whom the writer considers to be righteous, functions as an expedient, an expedient measure that neutralizes threats associated with demonic powers until the present age of wickedness is brought to an end. This is, of course, not the only way powers in the present age, or, uh, age can be dealt with. And here we come back to Yuta's uh, lecture. In some of the more explicitly community-orientated and yachad texts, Curses are pronounced again against a chief angel or angelic being and against Belial. In other words, the chief power is cursed, not exercised. The pronouncements against Belial and his lot bring together and merge several evolving features that in their specificity are partly lost, yet whose conceptual framework is preserved within a new form. The eschatological framework found in earlier Enochic pronouncements of doom against the fallen angels, exorcisms, and hymns of protection is retained in the community's treatment of a chief figure at the top. In the Serah Hayachad, curses against Belial adapt language from the Aaronic blessing, as we heard, and should be understood in relation to the larger context of covenant blessings and curses found in Deuteronomy. If we may read the liturgy near the beginning of 1QS in tandem with the hymn at the end, the way of dealing with Belial presupposes the community's present communion in the presence with the sons of heaven. Already in the council of the flesh, God has granted them a participation in an eternal possession. Traditions that are pivotal in receiving Enoch tradition and paving the way for the Yahad way of dealing with Belial may be seen not only in the songs of the Maskil, but also in Jubilees. The Book of Jubilees presents demonic activity under the leadership of Mastema as an inevitable characteristic of this age until the final judgment. Thus in Jubilees, not only do angels reveal remedies to Noah for the warding off or neutralizing of, a f evil, of effects of, of, of evil spirits, but also the patriarchs, Moses, Noah, and Abraham are made to utter prayers of deliverance against them. There is no formal denunciation or curse against any of these malevolent powers. The Torah both frames and takes its place amongst these means of guiding Jewish communities along the paths of faithful obedience in anticipation of the end whose outcome is already known. The present is shaped by both an eschatological past um, and a future uh, that, um, that loops back as an inclusio to bring God's activity in history to its proper end. The thing to get from these Jewish texts is that there's no flight attempt to escape um, uh, the, the, the reality of suffering at all. Absolutely no. And when we look to even what is presented about Jesus in the Gospels and even to Paul, there really is no escape either from 
from, from, from suffering. Um, it's not really that Christology does it better. It's that Christology provides a, a different way of dealing with and negotiating with the same kinds of persistent problems that can be more um, fruitfully compared with the ways Jewish tradition proposes um, in, in a number of texts that these same problems can be dealt with as well. Evil is never destroyed, not even when Jesus exercises demons. It is simply relocated. In sketching briefly, the eschatological tension discernible amongst some Dead Sea and related literature, as they have to do with malevolent powers, we've not only come upon traditions that I think can be simplicity, simplistically said to have influenced Paul directly. I don't think we're talking about influence here. We're talking more constructively about what it means for a conversation between these texts to take place. To say, did it influence Paul or Jesus or not, is, 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 a, is a convenient question uh, that, 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 that avoids perhaps the real issue. Um, however, we do have to do with traditions that run counter to the impression that a number of New Testament theologians, in all their enthusiasm to recover the singularity of early Christian tradition, leave us to infer about the inadequacy of Jewish apocalyptic in perspective. Significantly, demonic powers, however conceived, are not thought to be destroyed so much as they can be managed by pious Jews who already could understand themselves as living in a time between God's proleptic establishment of control over evil and the effective defeat of it at the end. To be sure, the Christ event and perhaps even claims made by Jesus about God's nearness were, as any claims that arose in particular contexts, a novum. But they were a novum that, in terms of religious history, broke, but were they a novum in terms of religious history that broke through to an understanding of time that had not previously existed in Jewish tradition or had no real continuity with it? So what I've attempted to describe here suggests that the notion of God's inbreaking rule into the present world order, whether as a message of Jesus himself, if one understands Jesus in this way, uh, or one by Paul in relation to Jesus' significance, was not a flight from Jewish apocalyptic tradition. It was rooted less in an attempt to correct a Jewish apocalyptic idea of, a Jew, of, a, of the two ages for Paul than it was indebted to the theological tensions known to and experienced by pious Jews as they negotiated convictions about the past with their expectations of the future. The corollary to this is the conviction that evil will certainly be destroyed and that, in light of such a hope, means are given to negotiate, curtail, or to put its effects into perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Sure. That's such a wonderful question <laughs> um, and a very, very good way of putting it. I think what 
the implication of, of, of my thoughts today um, is uh, if I were to slot in to, to, to one of those, I would want to say that in terms of perspective, it is a Jewish answer to a Jewish question. Uh, in terms of uh, content, it is a Jewish Christian answer to a Jewish question. And uh, uh, if we, it, it anachronistically, thinking, thinking back, it, it very easily slides over into being a Christian solution uh, that is better than any solution that Jewish tradition could come up with. Um, there, 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 there are. I think I'm more interested, I, I, I'm less interested in the obvious that, okay, we have to do with a man, a Jew, who in recent times, so Paul and so forth, was crucified and raised from the dead, and that this is different. We all know that's different. And my colleagues who are Jewish, uh, I'm sorry, who, who are Pauline theologians, will often say, yes, but you've got to go to Christology and so forth. My interest here is, is, is really in, in function. What do the texts of the New Testament actually do for those who, for whom they are written and for those who are writing them, um, based as they are on convictions about Christology in relation to Jesus? And to what extent does what they do for their audiences differ or can be comparable to what other texts in, in non-Christian Jewish tradition did for those who presumably received them. And here, there are probably differences, but I, I wouldn't want to be, um, and I wouldn't want to just meld it all together into one, um, but, but, but here I think a level of comparability uh, emerges that has largely been neglected. You're right. You're, you're absolutely right here. And I think that much of the language I adopt in the second half that talk about Judaism and even about Christianity um, is, is potentially misleading precisely because of the focus here on function. And uh, I, I think, I think that's, that's right on. Yeah, thank you for that comment. Chris, or, or I'm sorry, you, 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 Steve. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that, that, is, that is important. I do not, I mean, there are in, let's say, the ha Passover Haggadah, there are certainly allusions to what is ultimately hoped, you know, will be. I, I'm looking more specifically for language that will, that will twin what happened in the past as, at that point, guaranteeing what is to come. Not for the narrative to go from the past and eventually end up in the future, you know. Because I'm interested, maybe others are too, uh, in, in what that particular event signifies. And implicitly, certainly, the celebration of these, the, the, the festivals are a way of, of inculcating, uh, and I mean ritualizing in a very positive sense, this uh, and embodying these events um, I I in the present. Um, what, what, sh what we should not do is, is think, okay, there are the Jewish apocalypticists or whatever, you know, they are. And then there are those who, who uh, observe the festivals. These are blended together. And if we think of jubilees in particular in this way, we're to imagine a world in which the celebration of God's redemptive acts in history goes hand in glove to, with the <coughs> defeat of evil and all that it entails, without pretending that evil is going to disappear. Thank you. I think largely yes. I think largely yes. And um, you know, a lot of these categories and, and distinctions and whatever uh, it dissipate. They shouldn't dissipate altogether. I'm not trying to relativize any of these categories. They, they have meaning. <coughs> but they dissipate when, when our point of departure is not Christian versus Jewish tradition, but the human condition. And that is scary because then we're starting to think about people of outside these religions as well. But, but, but if this is the, the point of departure, uh, then, then we have a basis on which to talk and to ask how do our respective religious traditions help us put the problems that we all face, despite whatever it is that we believe in the perspective. Yes, yes. And um, well, I'm thinking uh, specifically with respect to the Gospel of Mark. Five. Yeah, yeah, Mark five, yeah, that's right. He, he relocates this, this region. Right. Um, and then goes on to, to meet the same fate, going into the sea, it's like the right. But so, so um, I'm with you on that. But then a part of my reading of the Gospel of Mark is that um, the kingdom of God is at hand when everything's already kind of set. Mm -hmm. But it's like a mustard seed in a sense that starts slowly and It's, it's an interesting question. How, how does the ministry of Jesus, that is, as it is presented in relation to evil, uh, recast itself? Or, or is it taken up um, in relation to um, the 
let's say, the gospel about Jesus. Uh -huh. And really, I see very little difference in the pattern um, in, in, in um, the death and resurrection of Jesus. OK, right, you know, there we have something. But does it get rid of evil? No, it doesn't. It defeats it, right? so the claim, but it doesn't go away. Um, uh, just a quick footnote on Mark 5 and, and Matthew 8. If we read Mark 5 closely in, in, in the Greek, as I see it anyway, I think the, the spirits um, are not destroyed in the, in the waters. But if we compare it to Matthew, the spirits are destroyed in, 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 the, in the waters, which is interesting. Mark, I mean, sorry, Matthew's, if, he's, if Matthew is using Mark, he's, he's wanting to, to up it. I, I don't think there is any other tradition in the Gospels that um, would, would have the, the spirits actually destroyed. Peter. Question of things about when you're talking about the human condition, the function of text in different traditions addressing mm -hmm. the human mm -hmm. condition, and the perception of those texts and their function. And I want to get your thought on the extent to which focus might be affecting the perception of function. And what I mean by that. Yes. Yes. So, in let's just uh, use these terms glibly. Um, in Christian tradition, the focus on this one particular event as coming out is uh, therefore um, uh, uh, raises uh, the stakes on what is it, it is expected to do. Uh, whereas um, the recitation, um, the presentation of prayers of patriarchs, uh, not simply for themselves, but for, for their progeny. We at Moses, uh, especially Noah and Abraham, you know, audiences knew that they were prayed for by these patriarchs. I mean, that's what those texts actually do for them. They're not just praying for themselves. It's more dissipated. I think that's what I'm hearing you're saying. Yeah. And, and Yes, but, but, uh, but, but we shouldn't, I mean, yes, that's very true, but we shouldn't, um, I mean, that may be one way of explaining why there's so much hype in the early Christian tradition uh, that seems to return time and again to this one uh, big event. But obviously in, in Jewish tradition, um, in, in, in many of these texts, it's about storyline and it's about it's about what people do in the context of being God's people. And what people do is to see themselves in continuity with, with a story. So it is much more open-ended, in a sense. But um, that's, there are aspects of this that need to be worked out more and actually more carefully. That's, that's very helpful. <laughs>
good question. I, I don't know that I can really address that here uh, adequately. I think one thing I do want to say is that some texts actually perform a function, are, are, are meant to, um, are intended to, to, to do something for their readers, while others, a, a, on the basis of the storylines, while others um, are, they, they, they refer to storylines in order to find paradigms that can be emulated at a later period. Now, they do something for the readers and audiences, but they do so in a different way. So the watchers, for instance, very often are looked at as, as, oh, don't be like them. You can see what happened to them. Look at Second Peter and so forth. You know, this, this, and Jubilees does it halfway also. Um, but, but there are other traditions about the watchers that not only simply say, don't be like them, but, you know, it happened to them, and it happened to them because God has already defeated evil, and the world you live in, is one in which, you know, these powers are already somehow under God's control, which is saying something a little bit further. Um, Daniel, I think, works in both these ways. Um, I'm not sure about 4th Maccabees, but that's really helpful to mention 4th Maccabees at this stage. Thank you. So, good. Thank you.